Ooh, this video about to get black as hell because <laughs> I just got some. I just got my plate delivered. I was hot because I had got a a, a a a a chicken and bacon biscuit from Wendy's, and that John had a nerve that the chicken was pink in the middle. I was hot. Not I said, real chicken. <laughs> I said, "Oh my god." I was I was really mad. But a lot of y'all may, and by a lot, I really mean all, and by may, I really mean most definitely, not know about me is that before comedy, music was actually my first love. And when I say music, no, I don't mean a handful of hijacked flows and questionable bars over a, another handful of copyright free, one size fits all, insert your favorite trap rapper type YouTube beat here. But I mean like real legit music, like the kind that requires live instrumentation. You know, the kind that probably like a fourth of this channel's audience was conceived to. You hear that, buckles? That's called a note. And when you stack a few on top of each other, it makes something called a chord. Hey, I know that's a foreign concept to a lot of y'all, but so was fatherhood the future. And I mean... Look at this. That's called progress, friendos. So you know how most kids have a security blanket, like a favorite toy or a stuffed animal or a lot of times a literal blanket? Well, mine was this sight and sound Mickey Mouse electric guitar that I carried basically everywhere with me until I lost it somewhere in the bottomless chasm of destitution and despair that is the New Jersey Turnpike. Which, I mean, if we're going to keep it a buck, that's just <laughs> Jersey, period, ain't it? Well, I mean, that is unless you're rich enough to actually live in Manhattan, but you're also smart enough to know how overrated actually living in New York is when you can just catch a train or a bus across the bridge, whatever you want, and get the full New York experience without having to spend like three racks a month on what's basically just a janitor's closet with a piss pot in the corner and one of those fold out iron and board futons like on the old Tom and Jerry cartoons. Anyway, let's move on from that brief, albeit necessary, lesson on Northern Tri-State Geography and Linguistics. The point in me telling that story about my Mickey Mouse guitar is that I developed an interest in music very early on in life. An interest that couldn't really be cultivated because one, we couldn't afford the music lessons that my school was offering and B and more importantly, I had absolutely F and all interest in playing any of the kinds of instruments that my mother didn't think were inherently satanic. Those being the drums and the organ and no white people, not the one that they played during your Mimos funeral mass. I'm talking about the one that they use in that one song that plays over like a third of all movie montages that are set in the 60s or the 70s or whatever. Yeah, that one. And because I am a rebellious heathen after all, I said bollocks to that crap. And eventually wore my mom down into buying me what had to be the worst built budget guitar ever made for my 13th birthday like no cap i probably would have just been better off getting one of those first act johns or even just putting a beer bottle on top of a two by four and then tying it down with a wire and then putting a little electric pick up underneath it like Jack White did in that one documentary that none of you remember or care about or probably have even heard of yeah that one anyway thus began my love affair with virtually every genre of music not named hip-hop pop or christian contemporary which i mean if we're gonna be real about it it's just pop music with jesus themed aesthetics and in the process of my discovery and in some cases rediscovery of some of my favorite artists of all time i realized something that had always been taught to me by my diet hotel family members but never really believed until i saw or rather heard it for myself and that's that pretty much all popular american music genres with the possible exception of country western 
is black music just distilled in a way that's palatable to white audiences and won't give y'all indigestion on the first go round. So in other words, it's absent of seasoning, just like <laughs> everything else white. Blues, we did that. Jazz, we did that also. Rock and roll, well, I mean, that's literally just the blues with the volume and gain knobs at like seven and nine o'clock respectively. See, I told y'all I knew what I was talking about. That being said, as these genres have become more and more a part of mainstream American culture and more non-black people have not only become a part of, but have become icons within these genres, kind of begs the question. In a music landscape as diverse and melded as today's, what really constitutes appropriation? What really constitutes black music? And how, if at all, can we avoid appropriating black expression? So this video comes largely as a response to a question I got in the second part of my How the Hood Was Commodified series, which if y'all haven't watched it yet, like go do it right now. I really don't know why it's taking y'all this long to watch it. Go now. But when I read the comment, the first place my mind went to was to the so-called blue eyed soul, which for the uninitiated is literally just R&B music that's sang by white folks. That's all it is. It's like if we call Eminem hip hop as told by honkies or because if y'all didn't notice, Tom Morello is actually half Nigerian calling Rage Against the Machine new metal for oh, years. And hope I don't get flagged for that. I mean, I am black. Now, hopefully y'all can see why a non-melanated soul singer might feel a little salty about arbitrarily being labeled blue eyed because again, there's nothing that makes them that except their lack of melanation. Like, think about it for a second. How differently would we react if there were a specific designation made for black country artists based solely on their blackness? Well, apparently the very concept is so alien to the mainstream music consumer that this woman doesn't even get to have her own name. See, here's the thing, as I've said before, black folks feel especially protective of our art and our culture because this country's ruling class has a very long and very well documented history of taking what we create and sanitizing it for commercial consumption and not even giving us so much as a KFC family feast in return. And y'all know how much we love chicken, man. So I get it, even if that wasn't the original intent, I get why the Blue Eyed Soul designation was created because, you know, God forbid Justin Timberlake or somebody be dubbed the king of R&B. And that's why they gave him the Prince of Pop instead. Then they made Harry Styles the king of pop, even though we had a whole like three decade run where Michael Jackson was literally making niggas faint on sight from just standing in place for a minute solid. And I can't name one Harry Styles song, even if it meant saving myself from castration. See, gatekeepers aren't always the enemy is the point that I'm trying to get at here. So let's leave all of that alone and briefly take a look at the history of R&B music, shall we? Ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. R&B, like pretty much all black American music, finds its roots in the spirituals and work songs sang by slaves. And because I would have to go through the histories of both gospel and the blues to connect all the dots here, I'm just going to tell y'all to trust me that that's where R&B comes from. Like blues is literally in the acronym, genius. Duh. So anyway, R&B, as the term was originally coined in the 1940s, was literally just that. Blues music with a bop worthy beat to it. So if you've ever played a Fallout game or remember that Is You Is song from Tom and Jerry. Is you will or is you ain't my baby. It's that. So for accuracy's sake, that's technically what's called jump blues. And it's not really straight up R&B. But for most of the 40s and the 50s, the two were basically synonymous, according to the record producers, because all black people look alike. Duh, genius. 
Like I said earlier, R&B as we know it today is just as rooted in gospel as it is in the blues. And it's this interpretation that laid the foundations for early rock and roll acts like Lil Richard and Fast Domino, and would eventually be stolen by the likes of Elvis, the Beatles, the Stones, etc. Matter of fact, bands like the Stones and the Who were originally billed as R&B acts before anybody had a word for white boy blues that wasn't just white boy blues. Because yeah, British teenagers, although were very racist, they weren't the same kind of racist as American teenagers. It was more so a, are black guys really bigger sort of thing and less a, let's just lynch all gorse sort of thing. I will be so surprised if this video gets monetized. By the time rock music was entrenched as its own thing, what had previously been known in the mainstream as R&B was now called soul music. Because we can never really get enough casual racism in the music industry, can you? This is Motown, the Detroit and the Philly sound era that gave us the acts that would populate basically every Saturday morning black house cleaning playlist. You know, your Marvin Gaye's, your Stevie Wonders, your Supremes, your Jackson 5's, etc. By the 70s, R&B wasn't so much its own thing as it was a catch-all term for all explicitly black music that wasn't just straight up gospel. And even a few explicitly gospel tracks that sold enough records to break into the mainstream charts like the Edwin Hawkins arrangement of Oh Happy Day. You know what it is, it's that one song that every white person in America knows or it gets played during the church scene of almost every black movie set during like the 80s or the 90s or whatever, even though there hasn't been an actual black church choir that's sang it for real since like 95. Yeah, that one. By the late 80s, with the rise of hip hop as a viable mainstream commodity, R&B, for better or worse, became much more defined as a genre by taking on much of the aesthetic and sounds of hip hop music. This is evidenced by the New Jack Swing era and the greatest unibrow this side of Anthony Davis. This was largely because there were literally like for people writing and producing every major R&B record of the time. Teddy Riley, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis, Quincy Jones, and L.A. Reid being those people. So that's five, whatever. Like, I cap you not, if you were conceived any time between like 86 and 97, it was probably in large part because of any, if not all, of these guys. So I got to thank them for my existence now, don't I? And that's pretty much how R&B as we know it today was born. That is to say, basically just sing-songy hip-hop music, which kind of makes you wonder what on God's great earth Betty Wap was supposed to be. Or what Drake is. Now while yeah, mainstream R&B has pretty much been what I just described since Janet Jackson dropped Control and like, 86 I think it was I don't know I wasn't born yet ask my sister and arguably today it's just pop music as sang by black folks right around the time R&B hip hop had reached critical mass artists like Erica Badu D'Angelo and my personal favorite music soul child and a bunch of other people I don't really have time to name, like ironically enough, Babyface, who co-founded LaFace Records with L.A. Reid in the first place, responded with an R&B sound that utilized primarily organic instrumentation and what were at least at the time less commercially viable black music genres like jazz, funk, gospel, even rock and electronica while also incorporating more introspective and conscious, if less bot-worthy, themes in their songwriting. This, folks, was the neo-soul movement, which sadly reached its peak when Miseducation murked the 99 Grammys and then kind of went out with a faint whisper by 2003-ish. Ironically, right around the time Lauren did, huh? But the legacy of that era still lives on in artists like her, Ari Lennox, and freaking D'Angelo of all people. Talk about Back From The Dead. And also Frank Ocean, at least during his Channel Orange days. 
I honestly haven't listened to much of Frank since he got cheap shotted by Chris Brown that one time. But then again, that is breezy in a nutshell, right? The toughest guy in the room when everyone else is either not paying attention or a woman. Now, the reason I bring that last part up is because aesthetics aside, there is a define sonic difference between neo soul and mainstream r&b music it may be a little difficult to define for the untrained listener but you know it when you hear it kind of like scotus's old definition of obscenity and then we wonder why roe got overturned it's a difficult one i think a large amount of it over the decades has, has sort of been where their marketing has been has diverged and therefore the way they've been packaged the people they appeal to has differed. The fact that soul, in a lot of ways, you can still see its ancestors, you can still hear its ancestors in a way that sometimes with certain mm-hmm. things that are defined as pop R&B, the only thing that might be carrying it is a particular type of beat and a particular type of voice. Soul to me and neo-soul has a closer relationship with things like jazz as well. Mm-hmm. But sometimes there's no difference. I mean, I think, for example, if D'Angelo was to have come out now, mm-hmm. As much as he is inarguably neo soul, I think his whole vibe, if if we were experiencing experiencing it now, I think people would call him R and B. So I think okay. some of it, mm-hmm. there is an element of nebulousness in terms of what wh- what's happening around the person, what's happening around the yeah. artist. Like Beyonce and Chloe Bailey are definitely pop as well as R and B, whereas Lauren Hill ended up popular, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. have necessarily have ever put her as pop. Mary J makes makes soul. Right. Um, and then at that same time, like Faith made soul R and B. And then like, I don't know, Whitney was making I mean Faith made soul and then Whitney was making R and B pop. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh Janet was making R and B pop. Even now, like Beyonce's making R and B pop. I don't know who's making soul right now, to be honest with you. Uh D'Angelo. Yeah, <laughs> like D'Angelo's still making music? Like <laughs> I mean, you know, ain't nobody really out there. You know who's making you know who's making the best pure R and B and folks gonna be mad at me? Freaking Jacquees. Folks, folks been clowning Jacquees for years. If you go listen to his music, he ain't got the best vocals, but that's some like pure R and B get the draws type track. But yeah, like there's a there's an essence to it. You know, I, I saw my aunties, if I saw my aunties dance to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If they played it at the cookout or the family reunion and it it hit a nerve with my elders, that's soul. And if it was just like we bought the dance and, and party or whatever, or, you know, fun, but not hitting that same note. And that was like normal R&B to me. It's 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 a nebulous kind of hard concept to nail down. But I feel like I feel like that's it. Soul for Marvin Gaye has a very um poignant emotional uh tether to blackness and the yeah. black experience when i think of marvin gay like i'm thinking of um what's going on the album not only mm-hmm. what's going on the song but yeah flying high all of that right and if if i could use that album as a benchmark for soul then i'm talking about not only the the instrumentation and the orchestration of it but just mm-hmm. the soul of it Right, the right. struggle, the inner turmoil, the encapsulation of what it is to be a Black person and Black culture. And when I think of R&B with D'Angelo in this case, I'm mm-hmm. thinking of the, the swagger um, and the, the uh, amount of... I, I hate it because like, this is what white people talk about Black people when it comes to this, but it just has like this, this um, ineffable coolness to it. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. when you hear D'Angelo, like you hear um floating in the dark, like that. Mm. Go. You know it's, what I'm saying? Like that, like that, right? It. Exactly. It's a bop, it's a swagger. And it takes like a lot of knowledge and time. Like, for example, like you know, when you mentioned music being more of a commodity or soul music and RB or just the uh experiences black people put in music, slowly becoming more of a commodity as those kind of experiences aren't as uh, critical. So for example, I think a lot of music now, especially whether it's R&B, R&B and I can't say for sure, Neo Soul, 
it doesn't have that like really creative spin to putting black experiences into music. And I say that as of now, because as I think of just two songs that stick out to me, one is by Marvin Gaye. And I think the other one is by the Isley Brothers. Mm -hmm. I can look them up, but there are two songs that when you listen to the lyrics, they're actually talking about like real world uh, issues, you know, but it sounds so good that you play it and you don't feel like you're being hit over the head with like something political. Maybe at the time Mm -hmm. people thought, okay, why are they coming out with this political music or whatever? Or maybe it was just masked so well. You got to get me getting these, this collard greens and shit on screen. Mm. Come in on this shit. (laughs) I see. I see. Now, who is the first person that comes to y'all's mind when you think blue eyed soul? Well, I don't know about any of y'all, but for me, it's Amy Winehouse. And I won't be making any alternative lifestyle jokes, not because I'm anywhere above it. But because, again, monetization and also because, man, I honestly would feel bad about doing that. For those of y'all too young to remember, Amy was basically the alpha version of Adele. And by alpha, I mean like in game development, not that red pill nonsense that man children like Andrew Tate promote. This isn't exactly what I picture when I think alpha, by the way. Like, Cap aside, that was her ceiling. But again, unfortunately, that alternative lifestyle kind of derailed her from ever getting close to that ceiling. And see, it wasn't just Amy's aesthetic that made people call her a throwback. I mean, look at her. She's pretty much just brunette, dusty Springfield. But the fact that her sound harkened back to an era when talent mattered just as, if not more to your commercial success, than copious amounts of TNA. R- I mean, R&B and soul in general, there is a decently high um, barrier for entry. You, you, you still do you have to, in general, be able to sing. But with soul, you have to be more of an artist. So I think that there are therefore, it's a smaller pool of people to pull from where you can take them and package them as some kind of sex symbol in a way that you can take someone who has a half decent singing voice, um, package them as pop R&B, and make them a sex symbol. And I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. It's more just, um, I, I just, I think that the, 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 you can fuck around less with soul. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this is also why you see a greater diversity in appearance among soul artists, because it mm-hmm. is just impossible to avoid. It's almost like gospel. Again, it's like you, you, you cannot overlook the powerhouses, but that powerhouse, may not be conventionally attractive. Like, when I think about, I don't know, Tina Marie, um, exactly. uh, Michael McDonald, mm-hmm. whoever did the, what they won't do. We didn't even know he was white till like um, 2008. Bobby Caldwell. Bobby mm-hmm. Caldwell. I didn't know that nigga. I didn't know that dude was white. <laughs> see, I know that see, dude was white. Adele came onto the scene also um, by the sheer mark of a talent because, of course, mm-hmm. she, she um, was a lot heavier when she came onto the scene and that of course defies a lot of um white supremacist european beauty standards uh so in mm-hmm. many ways she was already marginalized when she came onto the stream um onto the scene due to her fatness and mm-hmm. she lost weight and of course like there's some there's some different ways and now she's appealing to the beauty standards of white um european uh ideals so now she's kind of getting like a little bit of a different air to her mm-hmm. um before it was just like she's so talented. She yeah, was, yeah, she, yeah. She could, she could sing. That girl could sing. Now, speaking of that sound, remember how I said, even to a novice listener, there is a sonic difference between contemporary R and B and neo soul. And there, folks, lies my issue with the blue eyed soul designation. Bobby Caldwell, Tina Marie, Josh Stone. I mean, you could even throw in somebody like Nathaniel Ratecliffe. What makes their interpretation of soul music blue eyed except their lack of melanation again? And why is such a designation even necessary if it is at all? I mean, it'll be different if we were talking about Bowie's thin white dupe fees or Robin Thicke pretending like he had never heard Marvin Gaye being played at one of Paula Patton's family's cookouts. But 
we're talking about what is by all accounts an honest and soulful interpretation of music that just so happens to have been historically limited to black expression and consumption. Which now brings me to the Jack Harlow conundrum. I didn't know Dairy Queen had a rap label. Like personally, I I never got the hype. Like I I really don't understand why so many black girls were chomping at the bit to throw panties at this kid for making a career out of being this scene from Step Brothers, but with God's plan in place of Ice Ice Baby. Like cap aside, y'all. If you take all of Drake's S tier, even A plus tier lyrics, and remove them from his catalog, and then give him the little, I mean, minuscule amount of authenticity that Drake had before his F it, I'm a pop star phase and take that away too. That's Jack Harlow. Like if hip hop had a food pyramid, Harlow would definitely be in the junk tier, which isn't inherently a bad thing. I mean, we all need a few bags of Doritos and packs of Tasty Cakes in our lives from time to time. But Michelle ran a whole freaking four-year campaign a few years ago against childhood obesity. My point is, in no world should Jack freaking Harlow be considered the face of hip-hop, pop, or otherwise. Now, my point with that mini rant is that in a genre as much defined by the authenticity of his artists as their actual artistry, Jack Harlow comes off as one big PR stunt, if I'm going to be real. Even if that's not a completely fair assessment of him. I mean, I I'm sure he's a nice kid, and from what I've heard of him, he's at least a passable lyricist, and he's not nearly as big a cornball as, like, Logic or Hobson, for example. But that all just feels like it's by design, if you know what I mean. I mean, he said it himself, Drake is his bar, pun definitely intended, from his own mouth, by the way. So according to the guy himself, Drake is Harlow ceiling, who even at his peak was only begrudgingly embraced by pre-2010s hip-hop heads for no other reason than, one, he did have the mechanics down pretty well, and two, there really wasn't anybody in the sphere who was there to challenge him. My point is, how does Jack Harlow get a pass for quite literally being a whitewashed Drake clone, but we have a whole subgenre reserved for white soul singers just because they're white soul singers? I, I think like we are, we like black people and sometimes to our own detriment, we are extremely infatuated and accepting of white people doing the bare minimum in any type of cultural arena that we are in. And we just eat that shit up. Like, we love that. I don't understand what it is. Um, but it's the same way when it comes to rap. Um, it, it happens with, uh, like, like if a white person even, like, tries to... It's, it's changed a little bit recently, but, like, historically, like, we have always... Um, been extremely not only embracing but like flattered like segregation has colored who what belongs to whom you know what I'm saying that's black that's 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 black people art that's black art you know this is white art this art is safe this style of music is safe for white people oh you're a white person that wants to do this well, well can you do it white boy you know like uh, you know, we get in there clapping. Let me let boy go. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. there's there's that that like element of how race has created these boundaries around art complicates why things happen the way they do uh, over here, at least. Furthermore, as the question that inspired this video poses. How much, if any, deference should those artists show to the black artists who came before? And is that deference a prerequisite to their cookout invite? Personally, I think it depends on the context here. So let's go back to Jack Lamore for a second. Regardless of how mad y'all get or how much of a homophobe you think I am for saying this, Little Nas X was never and is not hip hop. Get it? Got it? Let's move on. That being said, what the heck was this? 
Like, I'm sorry. Again, this feels more like a PR stunt than an honest to God acknowledgement that, yeah, maybe the Black Entertainment Television Awards should have nominated the black guy over me for what should be very obvious reasons. Then that coupled with this performance here in the context of the drama preceding it was very much giving industry baby. Again, pun definitely intended. And honestly, I halfway believe that all of this beef was pre-planned just to make the moment much bigger than it had any right to be. Now, let's talk about the real Macklemore for a second. This guy, this was the guy that Eminem would have been if he had a dad in his life or at least a sober mother and also wasn't from Detroit. Like, that's really the thing that did him in. Sorry, guys. Or at least that's what the mainstream built him as when Thrift Shop came out. I mean, the parallels to my name is are uncanny, are they not? It's a goofy novelty rap single that's catchy enough to garner mainstream airplay that's performed by an even goofier looking skinny white dude. The difference is if you've never heard anything by Eminem aside from like his first four or five lead singles, then you'd be forgiven for not knowing why for like the first half of the arts, this guy was every white suburban parent's worst nightmare. Well, that and a black guy taking their daughter to prom, obviously. Macklemore, on the other hand, once you've heard Thrift Shop, you've pretty much heard his whole catalog. Well, aside from the, if I'm a, just keep it a buck here, slightly cringeworthy social justice anthems that won him that Grammy that pretty much killed his career in the first place. And while we are talking about that Grammy, listen, like I've said before, hip hop is as much about authenticity as it is artistry, sometimes more so the latter. Its artists are also defined by their braggadocio and ultra competitiveness. So two things you do not do as a rapper is apologize for getting a dub over a contemporary. A legend maybe, but most definitely not a peer. And you most definitely do not run to social media to let the world know that you apologized. And that, boys and girls, is exactly what Macklemore did. Every single white artist that takes up space needs to, at bare minimum, do the bare minimum that Adele did, recognizing her privilege um, mm -hmm. in that space and speaking up in front of everybody about it. Um, did that change much? No, but it still happened. And why the hip hop community pretty much wrote him off as just another goofy novelty like Asher off a few years before him. God, I'm getting old. See, the problem wasn't so much in the ill-advised apology itself, which I mean, again, was lame. So much as it was Macklemore's choice to take it upon himself to let the rap world know that its newest chosen one had accepted the apology, making this feel less like a genuine apology than a solicitation for a cosign, which is somehow even lamer. Like, I'm side-eyeing both of them. Like, again, in that case, Macklemore did not pass the test. You should have known, if there was any way for him to not submit for that category, so it would have right, been easier right. for Kendrick to win. That's what you should have did, because the Grammys has a history of when Black people are in these categories with the best album, they give it to whatever white person they can. Like, yep. so every time in that moment, you could have took that moment to focus on that history, because it keep, it has happened time and time again after that. Um, and then even. With Kendrick saying, oh, it's okay, you can also say Kendrick had to do that because mm -hmm. when you are a black person in these industries, it's different levels of it, but you still have to be professional. You can't be, you can't be like Serena. You can't be like, um, and show your frustration when you mm -hmm. lose. You have to fake camaraderie because it will look bad on you. So I'm going to hope that was the case. But other than that, I don't, you don't have to you know, take his apology or whatever. Cause if you know mm -hmm. how serious this is because your album is so politically black, you should right, know this right. is racism and you should be like, everybody needs to boycott it. We should have been talking about the boycott forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it was uncalled for to 
be 100 with you. Um, mm. When he sent it to me, I was like, okay, you know, I could see him feeling that type of way because he a good dude. But um, I think for for confirmation from the world, you know, he probably felt like he had to put it out there, which he didn't need to do. He didn't need to do, but. Which now brings me to my point of even mentioning those two in the first place. I'm not going to sit here and lie to y'all and say that R&B soul doesn't have a certain aesthetic to it, but it's a much more nebulous one than hip hop's and a more radical one, at least today. And we'll get to that later on stick with me i mean it'll be one thing if tomorrow we saw somebody like billy eilish embracing the iggy azalea formula aka bbl plus blackface equals bank but we haven't really seen for a while since maybe Katy perry or better yet miley cyrus a mainstream white pop act practicing an egregiously shallow performance of what they think constitutes a black aesthetic and doing so successfully enough to garner widespread acclaim. And no, Doja Cat doesn't count because no matter what y'all or she says, the girl is still black. Unfortunately. So this brings us back to the original question. Should a white artist whose success comes largely, if not entirely, from performing an explicitly black genre of music pay deference to black artists within that genre just because they're black? And if so, at what point does it become just a solicitation for a cosign? And perhaps more importantly than that, why don't we ever have these kinds of conversations about people like... Bruno Mars. I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yeah, I bet half of y'all didn't even know that this nigga ain't even a nigga. I didn't even know that until he went through his uptown funk phase. And see, I didn't really care. Honestly, the same way I don't really care about anything that Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber does. The blondest and bluest of R&B pop acts since... Michael Jackson magically contracted a devastating combination of vitiligo and rhinoplasty sometime between Thriller and Bad. Again, sonically speaking, JT and JB, for that matter, were never what you would call soul artists. They were always pop, just with a touch of the exaggerated swagger of Miles Morales, if you know, you know. Bruno always had a Diet Prince feel to his sound what with all of the genre blending and bending that the two of them are known for. But in the same way that early Prince, despite how eclectic his sound was, it was still soundly based in funk. Bruno was always very much a pop guy. I mean, up until Uptown Funk, which I mean is a stark departure from his days of catching grenades and hopefully throwing them back. Otherwise, that would be the dumbest thing I've heard since Andrew Tate self-doxing. But I mean, my point is, Atomic Dog, this is not. Which is fine. It's an atypically funk-driven pop bopper, which is cool and very much in line with Bruno's whole genre-bending thing. But then he, along with Anderson Pack, who is black by the way went full philly soul and wound up winning a grammy for it how is this not just as sus as the mm's ongoing campaign to convince us that jack freaking harlow is rap jesus like i would say that bet ought to have been ashamed for this but when your weekly programming block has more tyler perry than the Greater Bethel Baptist Church movie night fundraiser, then honestly, you ain't got much dignity to lose now, do you? Please don't sue me, Tyler. I'm very poor. My point is, I'd bet my left butt cheek that if Bruno looked less like Bruno and more like, you know, there's a better than good chance that he'd be getting a lot more backlash from the black delegation for covering what's effectively my uncle's A-track collection. Oh yeah, and if you didn't know, Bruno is actually Asian, specifically Filipino. That's why I use this picture. Well, part of the reason why I use this picture, because you see, this is MC Jin. He's an Asian rapper from the 106 and Park Freestyle Friday era, the Free and AJ era, the good era. Jin could spit like 
jokes aside, the dude had more bars than a jungle gym. But like most battle rappers not named Meek Mill or Cassidy even, just because he had bars didn't mean he could drop a bot-worthy banger, which he never really had a chance to do. I'm not necessarily saying that he didn't have the ability. What I am saying is that just because you can spit doesn't mean that you can write good songs. I mean, just ask 50 Cent to tell you anything about the game's career and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But that's not all his fault. I'm talking about Jen, not the game. Everything bad that's ever happened to him is definitely his fault. Remember, this was the mid-aughts and half of the old hip-hop heads still bumping Ray to die like it had just dropped yesterday were still equal parts shocked and appalled that some Detroit trailer hit could spit as hard as any in the game. So a Chinese rapper... Surely he was going to have to de-emphasize his Asian-ness as much as humanly possible to not come off as a novelty, right? Right? Y'all gon' learn Chinese. All the ghetto. Y'all gon' learn Chinese. All the stuff. Y'all gon' learn Chinese. Yeah. When I yeah, so I don't know whose idea this was, but this whole presentation, I think, doomed Jin from Jump. Like, the whole video is packed with more Asian stereotypes than a Steve Crowder bit, and somehow it's only half as cringy and not nearly as pathetic. So, what's the point I'm trying to get at here? I feel like... Jin, due to his era and his explicit Asian-ness, was stuck between a rock and an even bigger rock of either doing his best he could to force people to pay less attention to that and more to his bars, or just go full crouching tiger or hidden pit bull. Bruno, on the other hand, whether consciously or not, benefits from his explicit ethnic ambiguity <laughs> talk about a word salad i'm a regular jordan peterson now ain't i what i mean is bruno is whatever the situation or better yet genre calls for we've already seen him do funk we've seen him do r&b soul hell we've even seen him do reggae and nobody batted an eyelash what's stopping him from going full dominicano and doing a merengue album at some point that's bodega music for the uninitiated poppy store for all my Philly folks. But yeah, I do think a big part of it is his racial ambiguity and the fact that he is not white. I think there is a lot of room given to non-black, non-white people, especially if their execution is good. It's almost like, okay, cool, you get a pass because at least we're all being oppressed by white people together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically to your point about him not being, it being sort of ambiguous and not being unambiguously Asian, I think that's a very pertinent point, because if you think about it, there are no Western unambiguously Asian guys mm -hmm. in pop in general, never even mind like funk and soul and R&B. Like, I, I don't think an unambiguously Asian man mm -hmm. would be able to touch that. I think there is I think a white man would have a lot more success than an uh, than an Asian man. And I was thinking about it the last guy that came even close and he didn't come close at all was jay sean and <laughs> i don't even i think a lot of people have probably forgotten about him now because it was so long ago again what if he looked like Jin, or better yet like jt or bieber or harry styles cue the culture vultures clarence <laughs> Sam Smith is like a really good example of this. Mm -hmm. Because if you turn yeah. off Sam yeah. Smith, Sam Smith sounds exactly like a black woman. Like, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. Sam, yeah. Yeah. Sam Smith, Sam Smith sound more like a black woman than a lot of black women. So, I mean, like, it's, it's crazy. When I think about that, you would never hear anybody say um, that Sam Smith is, is an R&B act. Uh, right. The same with James Blake. Um, mm -hmm. They would say before, if anything, they're an alternative R&B. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that that's a up like an updated version of it, and I find that white people are a lot more comfortable presenting themselves as alternative R and B artists rather than R and B. And mm -hmm. do would they be more successful? I think that R and B has its limitations. I think that the stigma and the stain of blackness, and it's very difficult to divorce R and B from blackness. Therefore, it it has the same sanctions. Mm -hmm. You know, like 
white people love black culture, but they don't like black people. So right. it, they will exactly. enjoy like like white consumption is important to this. Like, yeah, they will enjoy that, but at the same time, they're not going to promote it as hard as they would a pop act. For the likes of people like Adele and Amy, you also had the Duffies, you had mm. the Joss Stones, you had yeah. Jesse J, who was like one of the early sort of social media breakouts. Mm-hmm. And this was so I forgot had, all about her. Yeah, like <laughs> so you had all of these different people sort of floating around, and this was at a time because the the two thousands I remember very clearly, where we had hardly any black women singers in this country being able to break out. You had the Laura Mavulas, you had um, you've got Nao, you had Estelle. Estelle has been famously mm-hmm. on record saying that she had to leave in order to be taken seriously and this is a pattern that has been in place since the 80s i think Sade is probably one of the famous yeah. uh famous examples of this it's so predictable it's such a predictable pattern and Sade is light-skinned she's mixed race yeah so it's even worse for the darker skinned black women in the scene it's terrible so um there is no question that the likes of amy and adele benefited from being white adele also was never has never been packaged as an r&b singer over here okay so Jokes aside for a second, let's go back to the Stones. They, along with the Who, the Animals, and to a decidedly lesser extent, the Beatles, if at all, weren't shy about how hard that they stand for chess records, blues men like Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. I mean, Rolling Stone is literally the name of a Muddy Waters record, if y'all ain't know. So it wasn't Mick and the Boys' fault that American and for that matter British white teenagers were too racist to listen to Little Red Rooster in public unless a scrawny British kid sang it and by the time Woodstock had come and gone the Stones were their own thing again for better or for worse so is it really fair for us to accuse those acts of culture vulturing when in truth they were just interpreting a traditionally black musical expression through their own non-black lens i mean yeah it is but why is it and if that be the case where does that leave someone like doja cat everybody want to be a nigga but nobody want to be a nigga how about that question doja cat did not have the black experience she sings and raps about so that lets me know you are purposefully commodifying the black aesthetic Mm-hmm. to make money. And even if you're doing that, I wouldn't have an issue with that. Rick Ross did that. You know what I mean? Right. Half the NW, half the rappers we love, <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. The difference is you also do anti-black shit on the low. Right. And so if the anti, because I like Doja Cat's music. It's the anti-black shit on the low that fucks me up. It's not mm-hmm. the, you know, niggas ain't shit song in isolation when I like, I, I we kind of all know, Doja, you mm. ain't dating no niggas. Now, there is definitely a conversation to be had about artists like Janae Aiko, Kalani, and if you want to throw her in there, Chloe as well, benefiting to at least some degree from colorism. But this isn't that video. And there are plenty of folks, including friends of this channel, who have already made that video. So y'all should really go watch those. No, like, cap aside, y'all should go watch those. Yet and still, both those women, or I guess all three of those women, are black and have never, as far as I know, tried to conceal or push back against their blackness, even though, I mean, Kalani was never really explicit about it until she ain't have a choice but to be. The same can't really be said about Doja, though. And FYI, as someone with an Afro-Latina mother, as I've said a couple of times now, who doesn't identify as Latina, except when it gets her discounts at the poppy store, I'm not having any biracial discussions with y'all in the comments. If you look black and you identify as black, I consider you black, unless you say or indicate otherwise. Unless you're these people. No, these people don't count. So y'all remember a few years ago when Lana Del Rey had a public Twitter temper tantrum over all the female pop acts leaving her in the dust and pointed to they exploiting their sexuality to do so? Remember how all of the ladies she called out by name were colored? Yeah, I'm not going to 
call Lana a racist, even though that tweet was giving big Karen vibes. But like I and others have said in the past, black women are able to succeed in the pop music space, exploiting our collective horniness because that's what society thinks black female sexuality looks like, sounds like, and acts like. Also, I will point out how kind of sus this take was coming from someone who's made a career of trying to gimmick her way into superstardom. Like, I get the point that Lana was trying to get at in that tweet. And like I said, I did make a whole video in the past about the way that black female sexuality is treated. But again, this is coming from somebody who made a whole song titled, I feel my way to the top. So this comes off as more bitter than anything is what I'm saying. I bring Lana up because as light as this light was, despite how ill-advised it was, it pales in comparison to how outright antagonistic Doja has been to blackness, specifically to black manhood, despite, again, her being black herself. And that, folks, is what I think allows her to get away with it. I'm not going to sit here and go through every documented instance of Doja's pick me but suffice to say, the girl has some, shall we say, identity issues. And that I can at least sympathize with. My issue is that she has made a habit of embracing community with black folks only when it benefits her interest while also simultaneously ridiculing blackness as a means to access community with whites. And listen, if you are a biracial person who jumps to correct anyone who calls you black, that's your business. I really don't care. Different strokes with different folks. Like I said, my mom's dad was a white Latino man who she only saw like two or three times in life. And that's why she identifies as black and why I've rarely, if ever identified myself as Latino except that one time I dated a Dominican girl if you know you know my issue is when you have a pattern of belittling blackness and even black trauma allegedly while making millions performing that blackness and this folks is why despite her blackness many black folks myself included would say that Doja qualifies as a culture vulture she chooses to be black when it's beneficial, but she's shown time and again that when the opportunity for her to claim whiteness presents itself, she jumps at it like an Olympic hurdler, which again, in my opinion, is more a you problem than anything else. But it becomes an us problem when you belittle blackness or knowingly do harm to black people to do so. And it's not like Doja is the only black person guilty of this. And it's also why I personally don't find fault with someone like Bruno. Because you see, the thing with Bruno is, it's not his fault that he looks like a black creator character from NBA Live 05. Or that he grew up listening to the music that he listened to. We're in a day and age where a lot of things are losing meaning because of people taking things too literally. And mm -hmm. then it expands beyond what we need. It kind of reminds me, I was on YouTube Live one day and I think someone said there was like a Black History Month exhibit at this thing that this um, museum that they volunteer at. And it's run by a lot of like non-Black people. And they like axed like a room of non-Black music I mean, a, a room of non-black people, like, um, this is, black people historically eat soul food. What is soul food to you? What is soul? And I was like, no. I was like, this has to be an activity, you know? Oh, no. See, it can be argued that Bruno is making a career at this point out of performing some version of blackness as opposed to 10 years ago when he was basically just a sentient cultural melting pot. But where do we draw the line and say that an artist is just straight up stealing from the culture, which I don't think Bruno is. All those Silk Sonic covers you hear on adult contemporary radio, all of those are already pretty much standards in most black households. So it's not like Elvis literally ripping off race records and doing the best and widest interpretation of it he could muster. 
Still, I think Bruno is, even if not great, another example of how blackness, despite being responsible for a butt ton of American cultural contributions to the world, is never treated with much value until it is proven commodifiable by mainstream, i.e. consumer culture. And more often than not, it is not deemed so until it is performed through a non-black lens. Because at the end of the day, as it's become a running theme on this channel, America really, really loves everything about black people except black people. Just like Elvis, we can do the same thing the black people do, but it's safe and I'm blonde and I'm smiling, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so, but then when they go solo, they got to repackage to get closer to the, uh, then there's like, like a transition. And you see that with Timberlake, with Bieber, um, uh, what's the white girl that got big off twerking? Um, you know what I'm talking about, Molly Cyrus? Yeah, yeah. So many of them, it's like, all right, I got to reinvent myself. So I'm going to get more urban. Ariana Grande, I'm going to get more urban. And then I'm going to actually like be around black people all the time, in fact. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a nigga. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm been straight nigga for at least two years. And and now that I've separated myself from my former squeaky image, because I'm a nigga, now you really gonna like my shit. All right, mm -hmm. I've been a nigga for two years. Let me get back to being white again, but still keep some of nigga aesthetics. And now I'm, you know, now I'm established. There was a song a couple of years ago, Paying Black Girls, by someone called Any, and it featured Amia Brave, who is a black R and B singer over here. And then it was literally meant to celebrate black girls it was um paying means good you know it's a, it's a compliment and the the video was full of dark skinned black girls the two performers are dark skinned black women and then the remix featured georgia smith who is a biracial girl mm -hmm. and if you go on youtube the original has about 2 3 million views and the remix, which came out not long afterwards, has 22 million views. We're conditioned as a society to not see the value in artistic expression unless and until it is bag worthy. And in order for it to be made bag worthy, it must first be made palatable to a white audience. Look at it, for as much as we clowned her for it back then, Miley Cyrus, at least as far as I can remember, was largely responsible for opening up the white girl twerk gate. And this is despite, you know, twerking being a thing since the percolator was. Also, this song came out before approximately 20% of my audience was born. So there you have that. Post Malone is another artist who became famous performing the widest interpretation of blackness he could conjure to the point of it basically being parody and everybody just saying, oh, look at the cute little curly haired white boy with the gold fronts in the face that looks like a penmanship workbook. Isn't he dandy? And I know she's not R&B, but y'all remember when Iggy Azalea was supposed to be what Meg is today? You remember why she was built like that aside from the T.I. cosign? Because she was a white girl who had blackness so down pat that she fooled the mainstream into thinking it was authentic. And thus was the perfect storm of marketability to be Marshall Mathers Mrs. Edition. And honestly, even after they realized what we all knew, that it was all cap dull, she'd probably today be even bigger than Meg, Cardi, or little orphan annie over here are right now if only her songs weren't more mid than a michael jordan jump shot this is a thing of beauty by the way unlike this see gatekeepers are incredibly fickle like Lori harvey fickle but one thing they will not forgive is midness See, they will almost always forgive appropriation if your talent outshines or at least matches the level of your gimmickry. And even if it doesn't, if you have the talent to evolve past that phase, which <laughs> Iggy most certainly doesn't, and Jack, I mean, the jury is still kind of out on him, but right now I ain't looking too good just because of the overwhelming amount of hype around him and how badly he underdelivered. they will forgive your appropriation. I mean, Doritos, New Balance, 
Again, Jack was on the cover of basically every music magazine I could think of, plus that KFC meal deal thing. Ain't no way that y'all can convince me that this ain't racist. Again, I'm not saying he can't string together a serviceable bar or two, which, again, he can't. But that the final product was so below the bar of what was being advertised that the gatekeepers had more than enough ammo to kill his ascent on site. Now, back to Post. If Harlow was the white boy who grew up watching 8 Mile on repeat, Post is that one white kid at every HBCU who only went because he thought the parties would be like a real-life rap video, which, FYI, they are, except very, very broke. Like, this is what the jazz singer would have been if it came out 100 years later. That being said, I can't pretend like Post doesn't have talent. Plus, his commercial and critical success kind of co signed that. Also, the fact that we haven't really seen or heard much of him in the past few years has kind of saved him from being overexposed. And that, folks, is another reason why Bruno hasn't felt as much resistance in his campaign to revive Philly's soul. He's got the talent to do it, and he's done so in a manner that respects his forebears. But most importantly, Bruno's soul is is authentic he isn't trying to perform blackness if you ask me he's just performing the music he grew up with which just so historically has been restricted to black consumption and expression and a lot of y'all might sit there and say well billiam isn't that exactly what jack is doing with hip-hop to which i'll say yeah you're right but also shut up but also like i said in another video hip-hop is as much about a lived experience and your ability to express that experience as it is your actual ability to rap which is why we've given niggas like kodak a pass I don't care. He may not be as bad as I said he was before, but his bars are still very, very mid. Oh, that's and that's why M got a pass, right? You could tell M was from the slums. You could tell M was 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 like running with with people in his neighborhood. He wasn't just a white boy. Um, he wasn't part of a white community. He wasn't part of a poor white community. He was in community with black people as a mm -hmm. white person, which gave him agency over the art that. Uh, what's the new? What's white Drake name? Uh oh, um, 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 Harlow. Like Jack, that Jack uh, Harlow. Oh, yeah, have. Yeah. You know, a lot of these white rappers now that are doing this new thing. That some of it's interesting, some of it's not. Um, and even even in the past, like I don't think freaking Ace of Rock was in community with black people. No, um, but he's good. You know, mm -hmm. he's good in a different way though. So I don't know if Ace of Rock was came out trying to do what the Locks was doing, he wouldn't have made it. You know what I mean? Adele can make a Adele can make an R and B song right now, or Afrobeat song, or a reggae song right now, and nobody got a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why is not only because Adele has gained accolades and um, nods from a lot of black UK acts, a lot of she's respected in the industry by black, white, everything. But also, is that class solidarity which you were talking about earlier? That class solidarity that happens with Eminem, and the reason mm -hmm. why, even though like. Eminem had some pushback maybe early. Ultimately, they embraced Eminem because of that class solidarity, because of the fact that Adele grew up in Tottenham. She grew mm -hmm. up in community with black people, not because she was dating Skepta at one point, but because she she dated Skepta because she's been around people like Skepta. Right, right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it ain't that like, she felt like she had to do this in order to... It ain't a Kim Kardashian type of thing. It ain't a Kylie right, Jenner right. type of thing. Where in order to approve and and um and bolster your blackness, you have to get a black epaulet to put on your chest yeah. or to uh, like you know you. The skill level for entry into R and B is higher. If we going to be real, therefore the I'm um, really about that life thing isn't as big a deal when it comes to R and B, but it is still a little bit of a factor in my opinion when understanding the real difference between R&B, pop, and soul music. But first, let's try to expand outside of this scope for the sake of really getting to the nitty-gritty of the point that I just discovered like two days before recording this video. 
Jack White and the lesser known John Spencer are two more examples of what I'm talking about in respects to artists who, despite not being R&B, fall into the blue eyed blackness sphere. The two of them have never been shy about giving flowers to their inspirations, even in John's case, using his popularity to platform and even bankroll albums for black artists that people like me would have never heard of otherwise, like R.L. Burnside. Also like fellow honorary blue-eyed black Eminem, Jack White is from Detroit. And no, I don't mean grew up in a gated community 20 minutes from downtown Detroit. Jack is actually from the trenches, believe it or not. The youngest of like seven kids, I think. And again, it's not necessarily where he's from that matters, but it's his experience of growing up just above the poverty line and going from eye job to eye job from early adolescence up until I guess the point that he broke out to make ends meet and blues music resonating with him based on his shared experience with the artist who influenced his sound. See, I didn't get into the White Stripes until well after their peak, but it was through Jack White that I discovered Sun House, Willie Mack Tell, Lightning Hopkins, and a bunch of other Delta bluesmen that again, I would have never heard of unless I had heard Dead Leaves in the Dirty Ground first. Still, what does it say about the way that we consume art that it took two white dudes to introduce me, a black kid, to a bunch of other black guys that have largely been lost to the mainstream music culture outside of hardcore blues heads. Well, what do you think it says, bucko? Something I've been saying since the beginning of this channel, and something that I literally said like two minutes ago, is that America loves everything black except the people, duh, genius. Now, let's use as a counterpoint who has been viewed by the mainstream, at least, as the de facto face of white boy blues for like the better part of the last two decades. Casual racism and misogyny aside, John Mayer, aka the muse behind like 60% of Taylor Swift's catalog, is pretty much Drake for blues men. What I mean is the problem with Drake was never his chops. It was that he didn't fit the mold that the hip hop gatekeepers had designated for the chosen one. And okay, that's admittedly unfair, but knowing now what he would become, I think it was a rare instance of gatekeeping actually being validated when it comes to Drake, but you know, Feek already did that video, so let's move on. Now, imagine what hip hop would be if Kendrick hadn't come until like five or 10 years later. You ever wonder what happened to Mayor after your body is a wonderland? Well, he became that but for the blues i'm talking about drake with no kendrick not a wondrous body obviously and i'm not by any stretch a hardcore blues head and if there are any watching they'll probably say that it was bonamassa or Derek trucks or johnny winter or somebody who was there kendrick but let's keep it a buck folks for like a good decade mayor was mainstream music journalists go-to blues guy whenever they needed a guitarist to throw on the front of their cover nine times out of ten it was mr hitler dick over here his words not mine by the way it really wasn't until gary clark jr burst into the mainstream consciousness that blues had a legit crossover candidate and by that point mayor had already gone back to doing soft boy music and therein lies the issue with Mayer. To a lot of blues purists, which again, I'm most definitely not, Mayer wasn't ever a blues man. He was a pop star who just got bored of doing pop, so he ripped off a bunch of B.B. King and Eric Clapton licks, who himself basically epitomizes everything sus about white boy blues, and started calling himself a blues man. He was a guest, at best, in the house of blues. But he most definitely wasn't a resident, let alone the spokesman. But that's what music media made him into. And I mean, whether that's fair or not is up to you to decide. But again, once he got bored of being a Clapton clone, he went right back to making wine mom music. Um, the money people make is the biggest thing. Like if people mm -hmm. weren't able to come into these spaces and make more money than black people do and change their lives before other black people of course, that means that there has to be some gatekeeping done. There has to right. be more rigor and like some critical testing going on before they're just allowed to 
you know, take up space. You have to be willing to sacrifice us to market yourself to a white audience. It's, mm. I don't know how, it's somewhat unfair if, if we want to be like completely uh, objective. It's a somewhat unfair rule we have in community that look, once you don't want our money exclusively, you can only have this much love from us. Or you gotta, or we gotta sacrifice this, this much love. You, you know what I'm saying? There's a limit. If you with community the whole time, then we love you to death. Mm -hmm. Again, Tina Marie, John B, so on and so forth. But if you in and out, or you in and then you want to, you know, do a tour out, when you come back, it's gonna be like, hey, welcome back. It's gonna be a different energy. So y'all have heard me use the term gatekeeper a few times now, and you probably have an idea of what I'm talking about, but what you want to know is who exactly it is I'm talking about. Well, no one and everyone <laughs> all at the same time, which is also the title of my debut EP. Jokes aside, it's just old heads. That's all gatekeepers are. People who have been around long enough in the community built around these genres that they have a vested interest in maintaining the integrity of said genre. These folks matter because when the gimmicks ain't gimmicking like they once were and the mainstream ends its fling in favor of the newest musical fad, the old heads are going to be the ones keeping the genre viable. See the blues. At the end of the day, all this genre purism over what's pop and what's R&B and what lies in between is really nothing more than a near century old music industry marketing gimmick. It just tells the industry who is consuming what and to which audience to market a particular sound to. It also tells the industry what sounds and just as important what aesthetics are deemed desirable by the mainstream and thus worthy of assimilation into the giant melting pot of mass production that is pop music. At the end of the day, R&B is practically speaking music that is more easily marketed to a black audience as being black music because the mainstream just ain't rocking with it to the point of it being worthy of the pop label yet. Or at least that's my take on it. So my point is, I really don't <laughs> know what my point is, frankly, and I halfway began regretting making this video because I get both sides of the argument. That being said, you gotta understand, aside from gospel, and no, I don't mean CCM, I mean legitimate, honest to God, hand clapping, foot stomping, soprano, tenor, alto, section 736, progression on the Hammond B3 with the janky Leslie speaker gospel. Soul music is the last explicitly black genre of American music left. Not even the blues has been safe from mayonization. And I know a lot of my white audience probably doesn't see the issue with that. And frankly, neither would I. If it weren't just further evidence of mainstream, i.e. white American cultures falling in love with black art while simultaneously perpetuating black oppression. Which now brings me to the point of this video, finally. All black music, so basically all music, at least on this side of the globe, was created as a response to the condition of the people who created it. In that way, black music is innately political, even if not always explicit or intentionally so. And that's what I think we're really getting at when we talk about authenticity. It's not necessarily race or socioeconomic status or even music ability, but it's the ability to speak to the condition, to the soul, if you will, of the culture in a way that only someone who has lived in the culture can. And going back to Drake and Mayer, this is why I think they had such a hard time being embraced by the gatekeepers. But Drake especially. I mean, admittedly, hip-hop had lost a lot of its politic that defined it 
in the 80s and even during the gangster rap decade by the time we got to the mid arts but even in that period Wheezy, Jeezy, Tip and Yeezy who are probably the most popular acts during that time all spoke to the culture in a way that only someone who lived within the culture could Drake, on the other hand, I mean, he had the mechanics down pat, but again, this was Jimmy from freaking Degrassi. You got to remember, he was not one of us by like a Canadian mile, meaning his music was always going to lack that special seasoning that makes music soulful. When you divorce R&B, and frankly, any music genre, for that matter, from its politic, it becomes purely pop, regardless of the sonic aesthetic. And that is what, in my opinion at least, not only makes soul music what it is, but makes all music, matter of fact, all art, period, more than just a disposable commodity. The ability to speak to people, specifically the people whose experiences shape that genre in a way that someone outside of the culture just can't it goes beyond just the chord progressions beyond the syncopations even beyond the lyrics it's striking a nerve with people in a way that 30 40 even 50 years from now it will stick with them to the point that it will make them want to pass that experience down to the next generation it's taking the pulse of the culture giving a diagnosis and sometimes even a prognosis. It means being timely as opposed to just of that time. So this then begs the question, in a music scape like today's where artists are more inclined to follow whatever fad will get them to the top of the Hot 100 as quick as possible than they are to, you know, create something that's truly timeless, is soul music dying, if not dead already? Well, I would like to think not, but it is a conversation I think that's worth having because as much as folk like me would love to stand the scissors and the Chloe's and the breezies of the world, well, maybe not breezy, he can burn in hell. I can't say in good conscience that 20 years from now, I'm gonna call what's basically the side chick, the movie soundtrack, soulful, even if it is the artist's own experience. Well, allegedly in her case. What I'm saying is there is no easy solution to this conundrum. And I personally think it's a little disingenuous for us to be so concerned with non-black people performing soul music when black folks ain't even doing it ourselves. Or at least not to the degree that I'll be updating my Bleach and Pine Saw playlist anytime soon. And yes, that is an actual playlist I have on YouTube, by the way, right between my bedroom bops and Coco Melon. I do have kids, remember. What I'm saying is what the world needs now are more Jasmine Sullivans and fewer Summer Walkers, more blondes and fewer breezies. And for that matter, Melt My Eyes is, TFS is, and whatever that new yachty album is and less this less whatever this is what i'm saying is black folks let's get back to making art for art's sake and then we can worry about who is and isn't worthy of performing it because so long as we ain't really talk about much besides twerking and toxic relationships anyway that may or may not even be our own to begin with I don't have a problem with the likes of Adele or Bruno being the flag bearers for Soul. But then again, y'all did give Kodak three top 10 singles at one time, so I ain't got much hope for y'all. Deuces.